Acting in 18th century colonial America was not terribly different from what you see today. Certainly during Shakespeare's period, it was very different. Uh, at that point, the way they rehearsed things was in parts. You got your cues and you got your lines. You rehearsed on your own, and a manager would be the person that would teach you your role. And you would actually mimic that person's behavior almost to a T, uh, and that would be how you would perform it. And that would be the gauge of, of, of uh, how people would, would judge whether or not you were doing a good job. Actors, this was the age of the actor. Um, oftentimes a play would be read, there would be, a play would get a reading at, let's say, Drury Lane, uh, or one of the major theaters in London. Uh, the actors would then essentially tear it apart and just rip it to pieces. And oftentimes actors would change the lines. Uh, it was not at all uncommon for actors to improvise on stage and just completely wholesale change uh, uh, everything that they were given. In this period, uh, things were starting to change significantly. This is when people like David Garrick, and David Garrick um, was the most famous uh, actor in England of the 18th century. He was really trying to revolutionize things and turning into a, a bit more naturalistic, a bit more realistic, the truth of the emotion in the moment. And so he was doing a brand new type of acting, which involved basically stopping, and if the character was supposed to be surprised, then he would stop and let that moment land and show you surprise. Now, we would see that as being kind of this declamatory emoting, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it was the bridge towards where we are now. It's the bridge to Marlon Brando. Without David Garrick, we don't get to Marlon Brando. You're in the 18th century. You're either in the colonies or you're in England and you decide uh, that I want to be an actor. You do that in, in several different ways. There's the professional route and the amateur route. There's many different ways of getting into it, but I would say the more conventional way is to have a great deal of training um, uh, by people who know what they're doing, and you would really have to fight to get the, 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 better, the better people. And there was also a stratification as well, so the leading actors would get trained by David Garrick, let's say, but the smaller actors would get trained by the leading actors in the company. Oftentimes it was best since you had to have a very large repertory of roles. You had what was known as uh, a line. So if you are the uh, clown line, then you're going to be playing the gravedigger in Hamlet, you're going to be playing the porter in uh, Macbeth, you're going to be playing people on down the line, Touchstone, uh, that sort of thing. But to be an amateur was to do theater as, a, um, as an intellectual exercise. Acting in theater is a hard bit hard life. It is today, just like it was then. Actors have often been called rogues and vagabonds. We're either idolized or we're rogues and vagabonds, and it's still true today. Actors during this period often struggled with even becoming actors because they knew that the moment they became actors, they were going to be viewed a certain way. So even David Garrick, the great David Garrick, uh, in a letter that he wrote to one of his, I believe it was to his brother, he said, um, I know this is going to reflect negatively on how people view me, but I have to do this. I have to be an actor. I can say that acting in both the colonies and England was the envy uh, of, of all the Western world uh, because they really were considered to be some of the absolute best performers that you could find.